Hey, good morning, Bob. Good morning, Ken. I have no idea how to put my name at the bottom of my picture. Actually, it's already there. You're okay. good to go. I think it does it by default. Okay. And then uh, Jeff is there as well. In fact, I'm going to type into the uh, chat as well, just so people know we're here. And now we have a uh, Lori Ramos that is with us. Ramos. Good morning, Nicole. Good morning, Maisha. And I think Jeff will be back with us shortly and we will get started. Here I am. Back there he is. There he is. Okay. And then I see uh, Tom is with us as well. Hello, Tom. Well, it was kind of a short notice. Okay, that's okay. That's okay. So, anyway, I'm I'm in here, so here I okay. am. Okay. Yep. Hey, Tom is uh, to use a baseball term. He's pinching for uh, Joe <laughs> Model today, which is all good. But hey, but we know from working with with, with Tom that he Thomas he probably has just as much information if if not more. So it's all good. <laughs> Well, thank you. Okay. All right. What we'll do is uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, and and what I just remind people that are joining us is that uh, if you would, as you as you join in, uh, please type in and say hi. That way, two things: one, we know you're there, and then more importantly, we know that you have uh, you're able to use the chat function to ask questions as we go through the session here. Uh, that's what we'll be doing is if one of our speakers or panelists brings up something and it's not clear or you want a little bit more information, uh, make sure that you type your question or your follow-up uh, thing in because ultimately we want to make sure that we answer questions and talk about what's important to you to get the capital you ultimately need. Uh, today's panel, uh, what we'll be doing is we'll be talking about equity investment, angel investment, and as opposed to a lending panel, which would talk about getting capital from either a traditional lender or an alternative lender, what we want people to understand is that there's a different way to get capital, meaning in exchange, as a general rule, in exchange for ownership or some other form of compensation, you can get capital uh, that way too. So that's the overarching theme for today's panel. Uh, let me start out by giving each of the panelists a chance to 
uh, introduce themselves. Uh, I'll, I'll give them each about a minute, uh, if you will. And we'll, I'll tell you what, we'll start with uh, our resident SCORE individual here, a longtime uh, partner with the chamber. Uh, Bob Cushman, if you will, just take a minute to introduce yourself to everyone. Hi, I'm Bob Cushman. I have been with SCORE for 23 years. Uh, we're very happy with the Urban Chamber. We have been uh, residents here at the office for many, many years. And we, in fact, we saw over a third of the SCORE clients last year at this office. Uh, SCORE is, of course, the number one small business uh, information source. We have had over 2,000 clients this year just completed on September the 30th. And these were all people looking to start and grow their small businesses. I personally have been an entrepreneur. I started a golf cart shop right here in Southern Nevada. And uh, so I've been through the entire process of starting and growing a small business. And this did not involve having to get any equity investors uh, that we're going to be addressing, but I will say that I am, in fact, uh, a venture capitalist on a very small scale. Excellent, excellent, Bob. Thanks for that introduction. And uh, as such, that gives you a perspective to let people know what they need to do in order to be attra financially attractive, if you will, uh, to get an investor like yourself. That's one of the things that I share with uh, people, too, is that uh, I, too, have been a small business owner prior to coming to the chamber, as well as uh, back in the day, I've been both a real estate investor, but I've also been a small investor with just a few zeros behind my name in terms of a couple of business ventures. So that's the reason why it was important to me to make sure that we added this to our catalog, if you will, of places to get capital from. So glad to have you, Bob, as part of today's panel. Uh, I tell you what, we'll, we'll go alphabetical order here. Uh, here's an individual that I think we've been working together for about two and a half, maybe going on three years now. Uh, glad to have him on board. Glad to have his entity on board. Uh, if you will, Jeff, please enter, take about a minute and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Jeff Sailing. I'm the co-founder and executive director for Startup NV. We are a business incubator and accelerator program focused on scalable startups anywhere in the state of Nevada. And as Ken said, we've been partnered with uh, Ken and the Urban Chamber for about two and a half years. And over the course of, the reason we started about three years ago was kind of based on my experience. I'm a, I'm a software guy, right? I've done, a lot, I've done seven startups, four of them have gone all the way to an exit. Um, and a, a few of them were Silicon Valley kind of thing where it's sort of geeky software stuff that you probably never heard of unless you were a big corporation. Um, and so we grow those startups and, and and go public and have an exit, and it's awesome. I moved to Nevada 12 years ago thinking, I'm going to do my next startup here. But there was no capital. There was no coders. All of the resources that I had used in the past just weren't available to me here in Nevada. So for eight years, I left. I got on planes every week. I went to Seattle, to Austin, back to the Bay Area. And I got tired of that, and I said, finally, it's we got to do something about that here at home. Um, so we started Startup NV to help founders who are sort of eligible or are appropriate for angel capital types of investments to learn what they need to do to be attractive to angels and you know get themselves in shape for that. And at the same time, what we've discovered, even though we've had some pretty good success um, helping our founders raise capital, is that there's very little startup capital, angel capital available in Nevada. So we've started a whole program to train angel investors. It's not for lack of wealth um, that, that there's no angel investors in Nevada. It's, I think, largely a lack of knowledge. So we're in the process now of training angels, telling them how to pick good companies. What's this crazy language that we use when we're doing our investment? How do you vet a company? How do you put a value on it? How do you come to an agreement with a founder on on something that's fair to everybody uh, so that when the company does grow and have an exit, the founder makes money, the employees make money, the investors make money, 
and guess what? Once that's done, the whole thing starts again. I mean, those those founders, those investors, they reinvest, they redo it all over again. And it creates, you know, a really great startup ecosystem for us here that can ride right along all of right alongside all of the other things that we do so well in Nevada. So, uh, so I'm here to provide education and to help the folks that as best I can. Excellent, excellent, Jeff. So great partnership again. Uh, this makes sure that here at the Urban Chamber of Commerce, we have the entire suite of capital uh, sources to make available to our members. And even non-members who come to our Business Success Center, there's still the ability to tap into this. So I'm glad uh, we'll get more into talking about it. Uh, what I appreciate is you come at it not only from the standpoint of people looking for money, but people who want to provide money as well. Uh, just a, a reminder, uh, to everyone, uh, please, uh, once you join the session, I think we have about 14 people here. So ideally, I'd like to have everybody just very quickly say hi, good morning, or something in the chat that, again, lets us know two things. Lets us know that you're here, but then at the same time, lets us know that you are you found and can use the chat feature because that's what we'll be using in order to answer questions. And I already see a question from Ashley. Randolph, we'll come back to that in a minute after we get a little further into our panel discussion. Uh, last but not least, I uh, want to ask uh, Thomas to introduce himself. If you would, just take a minute, kind of share with our audience uh, a little bit about your background as well as the uh, agency that you're here to represent today. Oh, make sure you unmute yourself. I do that too. It's all good. Because you never know what's <laughs> going to never know what's going to ring or something. But anyway, uh, I'm Tom Martin with the uh, Nevada S uh, Small Business Administration. I'm a lender relations specialist. I <clears throat> my position now. I work with the lenders. You know, as far as between the liaison between the lenders and the SBA, as far as trying to get programs. My background is <clears throat> actually I work. Uh, quite a few years for USDA, and I was in banking for over 20 years, and I came back to SBA. And I've had several hats since I've been back with SBA, but my background is 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 lending you know, and helping people. Uh, I understand what Jeff was talking about because, you know, I moved here in 2006. Uh, capital, I always found capital was tighter in Las Vegas than any place I've ever been. Uh, you know, I come from the Midwest where – you know, it was it was more of a handshake type deal. It was a little easier to get capital, but uh, we work with everyone. We've really, in the last few years, we've really tried to you know to go out not just loan from banks, but to help people get access to capital, whatever means we can get that access. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Uh, thank you. Glad to have you here, and. Uh, uh, Thomas Martin is with the U.S. Small Business Administration overall, but specifically he's with the Nevada District Office for the SBA. Uh, so they have a presence here in Las Vegas, and then they also have a presence up in northern Nevada as well. Uh, Thomas is with the uh, Southern Nevada Office. Uh, the, the Nevada District Director is Mr. Joseph Joe Amato. Uh, unfortunately, he can't be with us today, but Thomas is with us, so uh, we're in good hands. So thanks again, Thomas. Let, let me ask, what I'll do is I'll do a round robin here. Uh, I'll start with this question. Bob, if someone's interested in getting investment capital, we know from a traditional lending standpoint, there's paperwork and documents that you have to produce, but just in general, Bob, what are some things people need to think about if they're trying to be attractive to a potential investor? The number one thing is you've got to have a plan. The business plan, which then gets turned into uh, presentations to potential investors, is the key because without that kind of long-term perspective, it's going to be very, very difficult to attract anyone. Uh, one of the things that's unique about a business plan that you're putting together for investors is that you must have your exit strategy thought through before you actually start the business. Um, the important thing to recognize is 
we're not playing in the small leagues when we go for investment. Um, the average small business that is eligible to even be considered by venture capitalists or any kind of angel investors, 28% uh, of them had more than $5,000 in the bank. 49% had more than $10,000 in the bank. And 23% had more than $50,000 in the bank before they were going to go for investments. So you've got to already have developed your plan. You already have to have acquired a certain amount of capital that makes your business viable from the very beginning when you're looking for investors. Perfect, perfect answer. And I like the one thing that you talked about, the official term is exit plan or exit strategy. Uh, what I've always liked to say, and this is whether I'm talking about business or some of the other leadership positions I've been in, I talk about begin with the end in mind. And, and some people may be sitting here going, well, wait a minute, I'm just barely getting started and maybe I haven't even started. And you're already telling me I have to have thought through or begun to think about an exit plan. Well, yes, if you're talking about trying to approach an investor, you need to begin with the end in mind or officially have an exit plan or an exit strategy in mind. So Jeff, I'll kind of appeal to you a two part uh, question. First one is, in order for us to be attractive to a possible investor, what do they mean by that uh, exit plan or exit strategy? And then at the same time, if you will, uh, if you'd address the startup envy work with the impact investing model in sure. order to be to measure attractability. Sure. So what whatever what you mean by an exit, it's, it's basically selling your business. So if you're a founder who wants to create a family business and kind of keep it in your family for a while and create income for yourself, that's awesome but you're not gonna attract an angel investor with that type of business. The only way an angel makes their money back is when the business is sold. And generally speaking, an angel who's going to invest in any business is thinking for every dollar I put in, I wanna get at least $10 out, probably closer to $50 out. So we call that a 10X, a 30X, a 50X uh, return on your investment. And they wanna make that in five to seven years. Um, and because they're investing in this business at its earliest possible stage, that's what they're looking to do. And, and you have to understand that, you know, you know, 70% of well executed uh, early stage businesses fail. So an angel investor has to invest in many businesses for to have a chance to succeed. And which is why they're thinking in terms of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 times their investment. And, you know, as Bob said, most of the angel early stage investors want to see that you're beyond the idea stage, that you've done something with whatever it is you're doing to create demand, to prove that your idea is actually viable in the market. You don't have to have sold much, but having created whatever it is you're doing, whether it's a piece of software, whether it's a product, whether it's a service business, whatever that is, you've started it and sold a little of it um, so that you can prove that the plan that you made is starting to work and that, that, the, that the investor has a chance of making their money back when you do sell the business. Um, with regard to impact investing, impact investing is one of many styles of investing. Um, you know, we have investors in our, in our family of investors who only want to impact, who only want to invest in uh, black owned businesses or female owned businesses or only green types of businesses. Um, and you know, all of those can generally be classified as impact type investing um, in the communities or in the, in the fields that you're wanting to work in. Uh, and we have many people that, that, that subscribe to that model where they wanna make money um, with their investment, but they also want to have an impact beyond just, you know, just investing in a business. Uh, so they want to promote a certain community or a certain cause or put their money to work in a certain way. And that's, it's, it's common, but don't misunderstand impact investing for charity. It's, they're not at all the same thing. They're not giving Cor you their money. <laughs> Cor correct. Correct. Uh, in, in fact, I'll just uh, tell you past history. I think it was called PAX World, but that was one of the first mutual funds that I invested in. It was called PAX World. 
uh, I think this was in the mid 80s, late 80s time frame. But the idea behind it was you could do both. You could be altruistic, but then at the same time, you could invest. And, and something I like, my term I like to use, but I know it's not just unique to me, is I call it, I believe in capitalism, but I believe in capitalism with a conscience, meaning, again, you can do both. Uh, you can make an altruistic or a social impact, but at the same time, you have to make sure that there's a viable business model there so that they can continue to do good things with your investments. So and a you, great question. Yeah, and you could consider Startup MB impact investing in Nevada entrepreneurs, right? Could, because we're only focused on scalable startups in Nevada. I mean, that's a pretty wide group of humans, but it's still having an impact on our community in Nevada. And that's, so it's, a, it's, a, it's that same idea, but maybe focused in a different area. Perfect. And, and that's the reason why I like the Startup NV concept is because uh, I applaud your leadership, your commitment, your dedication, Jeff, because what you said is there's an, there, there wasn't an ecosystem, if you will. It was a bit haphazard, for lack of a better word. And what you said is, no, we need a bona fide ecosystem and yourself and a few others are going to help lead the effort to make it happen. Uh, if you would, Jeff, if some, and I'll ask this of all our panelists, if you would, can you type in a website or a phone number for people to follow up? And I'd ask uh, Bob and, and Thomas to do the same thing. But Thomas, before you start typing, what I'd like to ask you is, yes, normally you work with traditional lenders, and I know you have uh, knowledge of alternative lenders, but at the same time, if a client comes to the SBA and they're interested in getting into an investor equity situation, I think it's called the, what is it, the SBIR, if I remember correctly? That's correct. What exactly, what exactly is SBIR? And I think there's an effort to bring that to Nevada. What's, what, what benefit will there potentially be by having a SB? What is it and what benefit will it be to Nevada if we can get that effort going here? Well, the, the SBI R has always been here. Uh, it's the SBI R is uh, supported by a lot of agency of the federal government. Uh, uh, my first example of actually knowing what it was, was there is a business in, in Las Vegas um, that used it and, what it is, it's a grant. You apply uh, when you start getting into a lot of it. You go onto sbi.gov and you you apply. There's certain windows you have for certain things to apply for the grant. But what it is, it's a it's a grant for. Uh, I'll give you the example. <clears throat> there was a group uh, here in Las Vegas that had a learning. Uh, a type of learning that they wanted to expand. They they had their plan. They already kind of got into it, but but you get funds. It's 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 three phased, if I remember right. You you get you apply for the initial grant. They give you the initial grant, and it's usually, uh, you know, substantial but not large. The once you get your first phase and you've got your program going and everything, you apply for your second phase of the SBIR. That's usually a fairly large grant, you know, maybe a million, two million dollars. And then the, you go into your third phase, and the third phase is hopefully in the third phase you're self-funded. Uh, but what it is, it's a grant program for people that have an idea, uh, you know, some kind of business uh, that, you know, they could, they could use the grant to expand the business and, and help build on it. Uh, it's like I've sent a lot of people to the SBIR. I've only known a couple that ever got funded, but it is a grant program, so it's not paid back. Uh, and like I said, SBA kind of is behind it, but there's also a lot of agencies that fund for that. Excellent. And and just so everyone will know, uh, I actually pulled it up on my phone real quick, real time. Uh, it's sbir.gov, and that is Small Business Innovative Research. Uh, that's Small Business Innovative Research, SBIR. But it's a 
uh, process that you can go through uh, to get access to uh, capital that's related to investment. Uh, I, you know, the, the other thing, it's kind of a companion program, is the small business technology transfer. And, and here's the idea behind it. If you have a, a, a product in particular, maybe let's take advanced manufacturing or like the drone, in, uh, drone industry. If you have a technology that you've perfected or in your, you're in the process of perfecting and you don't necessarily want to get loans on it because that might be challenging to do, but you still need an equity investment to move forward with it. Well, potentially you participate in this program and the idea behind the technology transfer is that it starts out in the research and development phase, you get some capital and eventually the term is commercialization, meaning you can take the product to market and then hopefully the business model with the product can sustain itself. But to prime the pump, if you will, that's my general understanding behind the purpose of this program. Uh, the reason why we're doing this panel, we want more people to get information about this, take advantage of it, or to, when they're strategizing how they want to move forward, they consider this as another option to get funding. Uh, and, and Thomas, if a client or if someone wanted to get some more information, I know they can look at the uh, website, but could they meet with someone from your office to get a little bit more information? Yeah. Yes, right now our office is closed. You know, we're still working from home. But I have uh, met with a lot of people privately if they want to, you know, you know, with with the COVID stuff. But I've met with a lot of businesses, you know, asking if, they, if it's OK for me to come in, you know, and stuff. But uh, they can contact me. I'll put my email on there. I'll put my phone number in a minute. Uh but they can, they can contact us anytime, you know, to come in and talk to us. Uh, and, and we'll assist them as much as we can. The, the thing I've known about the SBIR, you, you talk about a plan and really being prepared. You have to really be prepared. And you have to really have your business plan put together. Because it's very competitive, as you, as you would know. But I've been very impressed with the people that have got funded because they have built some fairly large, you know, businesses from these programs. Perfect. So we want people out there to follow up on this. If you have an idea, uh, I want to say thank you to Holland Wood for putting the comment that she did in there. Uh, once again, this is the reason why we're doing it. If you've never heard of SBIR before, uh, follow up with these individuals. Uh, Holland Wood mentioned the fact that the Nevada Small Business Development Center or NSBDC, they actually have an SBIR specialist uh, on staff. And here's what I'm, I didn't know that. So Capital Connections has already helped me out with another resource that I did not uh, know or was aware we had. Uh, let me come back to uh, Bob. Uh, you have SCORE counselors. Do several of them have backgrounds either getting investors or like yourself, maybe being an investor? And if so, how would I get connected to them through SCORE? Uh, there are several members of SCORE who have been investors in the past. Um, some of them are currently still investing. Uh, we cover a wide range. Um, a lot of it does have a real estate component. Okay, um, and that's an important distinction between uh, the types of investors that you get, because anything that has a security component, such as real estate uh, or a building, does attract a different type of investor and sometimes more money. Uh, so we have specialists in that, definitely. Um, anything up to, uh, let us say, uh, 50 million dollars. Uh, we also have people who invest uh, a lot smaller amounts. Uh, more than happy to talk to anybody about that. Um, again, there are 50 SCORE counselors with a wide range of experience, and the investing piece of it is relatively small because our main thrust is for people who are just starting up 
and growing small business. And uh, understood, but what I'm happy is the fact that you do have individuals that have that background. Uh, so what that means is if you see an idea or a concept and it strikes you as, you know what, it may be better for them to consider getting an equity investor versus just a traditional lender, you already have some individuals uh, within your score counseling network that could talk to them again, begin with the end in mind. Uh, because one of the concerns I might have is, depending on how someone starts their business model, if they start it in a certain manner, it may adversely impact their ability at some point in the future to either do business or document business in a manner that would make it viable for an investor to consider. So it's good to know that you have individuals on staff that can help begin with the end in mind. Uh, the, I guess the other thing that I wanted to point out is I'm happy you say that there may be people thinking about, hey, I'd like to invest in real estate and that is their business. So what you're suggesting is you do have some individuals that could talk to them about real estate investment as a business, correct? Absolutely. Okay, so uh, once again, uh, getting the word out there about uh, things for people to consider. Uh, and that's both if you're trying to become a real estate investor or if you'd like someone to invest in the real estate that you have, because for some people, that may be part of their business model. Uh, Jeff, I want to come to you and ask the question, uh, if someone is trying to get started in terms of documentation or getting their presentation together, what should they consider and what are some of the resources to help them put that presentation together? So there's, <clears throat> excuse me, there's tons of uh, places out on the web where you can go for startup presentations. And there's a lot of opinions about what you should have in your deck and what you shouldn't have in your deck. Almost as many opinions or almost as many options as there are humans involved in it. Um, there are some general guidelines and we do have um, available on our website at startupnb.org. If you, if you go through the process of applying to pitch to us, you'll get a lot of advice about what we want to see in a deck. Um, and then we link to a lot of other advice about what other folks want to have in a deck. And frankly, part of our program that we're going through right now, our Angel NV program that's teaching founders what angels want is actually teaching that very thing. You know what 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 should be in your bet in your pitch deck, and then how do you go about researching the information to make sure it's not just a slide with a pretty picture, or a few words on it, but there's some real depth to it. Um, so you know if you're if you're creating a product or a service um, or software in a certain market, you know you want to know how big that market is. You don't want to just be guessing at it. So there's some research that you have to to be done. But there's generally. Um, you know, anywhere from eight to 12 topics that, that most angel investors expect you to present on in your first formal presentation to them. There's always a version of what you do, your one minute pitch where you have no slides and no presentation. Yeah, the elevator pitch, you have to be able to articulate what it is that you do in one minute, make it compelling enough that where somebody says, I'd like to hear more about that. You know, and then they'll give you five minutes. So you have a five minute version of your presentation um, that's probably only covering three or four topics. And then you have the 10 minute version of your presentation that might cover those eight to 12 topics. And then you hopefully you'll get into that presentation with, uh, with a group of investors or a single investors who said, all right, I'm going to give you half an hour, 45 minutes. And then you can really get into the details of what it is that you're going to do, what your longer term financial plans are. Um, and so there's there's four or five different versions of of how you present your company and you as a founder or a founding team you have to be able to, to do them all uh, there's some of that information that we have available on our site um, and there's tons of other sites out there you know from the biggest ones like y combinator and 500 startups right. um, who um, you know out of the bay area who do a lot of this stuff they they make a lot of their material free um, to the stuff that we we get very specific about what we want to see to consider you for to get into our accelerator program or for our fund the funds that we control to actually make an investment in your company. Um, so you know, you know, why Combinator doesn't really care if you're in Nevada or not. We do. <laughs> um, right. 
So uh, everybody's got a little bit of a different slice on it. Does that answer Perfect. the question, Ken? Yes, a a absolutely. And in fact, uh, as always, I try to emphasize things when I'm listening and hearing certain points. Point number one that you made that I hope wasn't lost is that there are thrift, there are different levels and therefore different forms or iterations of your presentation. So one implied comment would be, don't try to pitch everybody with your 30 minute pitch. No, no. Tighten it up. In fact, we had a, when we did a session related to contract connections, what we suggested to people is everybody should have about a minute long elevator pitch and that's it. And, and in that elevator pitch, you're not trying to ride the elevator from the earth to the moon. You need to keep it tight and leave them wanting more, as P.T. Barnum said. So I'm glad you made that point. And I just wanted to emphasize that to everyone. You're not trying to pitch everyone. In some cases, you may talk to someone for about a minute. And although they may not be the investor, they may refer you to someone else. The, the, the other thing that I wanted to follow up on is the fact that if people need assistance getting their presentation together or getting those various levels together, you have a resource at Startup NV uh, that they can follow up on. So glad, again, you're helping to build the uh, ecosystem here for equity investment. Uh, one thing I want to point out to our Urban Chamber family is we actually have a graduate of the Y Combinator program that's part of our Urban Chamber family. Uh, Charles Whitby, I'll give him a, a quick shout out. Uh, they're in the cybersecurity artificial. Yeah, we can go ahead and clap. That's, that's a big deal. That's a really, really big deal um, yes. to get into YC. It's a big deal. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're part of the, I think it's either 1% or 0.1%. I mean, it's a really small number, but they successfully went through the program. What they're doing is they're part of the cybersecurity artificial intelligence space. So glad to have Charles Whitby uh, part of our equity investor network here at the urban chamber and it's also part of the reason why we're doing this is because what he suggested is that yes they went through that program but as an african-american founder they still have some disproportionate challenges identifying venture capitalists and inv angel investors for them to work with so i, I want to give a quick plug to maisha williams who i see is here with us today uh yep we can clap for her because what I did is I'm trying to get better at this delegating thing as a leader. So I asked Volento, whatever words you want to use, I asked Maisha to spearhead the effort to create the urban chamber portion of the equity investor uh, format here. So she's taking that on. She's working with Jeff and others to make that a reality so that individuals, founders like Charles Whitby will have a friendly source, friendly family. Uh, that they can go to. So thanks again to Maisha. I wanted to make sure that I uh, said that. And so if you're following right now, again, uh, please type into the chat uh, any questions that you have, but at the same time, please say hello so that we, we know you're here. Uh, question from Holland Wood. Jeff, what is the upper range of an angel round funded by Startup Envy? Is it something like 250,000 or so? Okay, so there's a lot of... Again, this is one of those things that has a lot of, there's as many opinions as there are humans. Um, okay. So generally speaking, there's sort of three phases or three types of investment in the very early stage investment. Um, angel, which is usually the, the smallest amount. So if you're dealing with an individual angel as opposed to a group of angels, they're typically gonna be in the, I don't know, 25 to $50,000 range. And then you get into the pre-seed funding, which might be a several angels put together or an angel group. Um, which typically focuses on sort of that 50 to $250,000 range. Um, then you get into seed funding, uh, which is kind of takes you from that 250 or the middle six figure ish range up into the low seven figures range. Um, and your, the, the expectation of where your business is to get those kinds of investments is different. You know, an angel may not care if you've actually started selling products yet. They're, they're investing in you and your idea. Um, where pre-seed people 
they expect you to have started selling your product or service or whatever it is before you're, they're going to they're, they're going to make an investment. The seed people now they want you to have sold probably half a million dollars a year or more um, in order for them to consider making an investment in you. You get into the A rounds and some of the larger rounds, their requirements are even bigger. At Startup NV, we have two mechanisms uh, for investing. One is Fund NV. Uh, that fund invests. $50,000 in the companies that are in our accelerator program. Uh, they have to be in the accelerator program for at least three months. Uh, we invest $50,000 in them, but we try to syndicate or add other people into our investment to make that 50 into 75 or 150, somewhere between 75 and $150,000 um, on top of the investment that our fund is making. Um, we have another program, Angel NV, where we put together 40 angels who each throw $5,000 into a fund. And together, those 40 humans invest that $200,000 in one company. Um, and that's still pretty, usually it's going to be a pre-seed type of invest, in, investment. But those 40 people learn how to be angels together. And then, then they decide what company they're going to invest that $200,000 in. So those are the two programs that we actually sponsor and control. Um, but there's a lot of other options out there. Well, not as many as we'd like to have in Nevada, um, but, uh, but, but there's other options and other companies that do slightly different versions of that same thing. But, but we're, but we're going to get there, Jeff, because yep. what I would suggest is knowing that you have the knowledge of what's possible, you can tell us all those different options or stages that we should have, and then we'll work individually and collectively to get there because what we may find out is there's even more people out there that have knowledge or expertise here and there. We just need to bring it all together. Uh, first, from our standpoint at the Urban Chamber, we're going to have our component, but we also recognize we want to be part of the greater component of what yeah. you're doing at Startup NV. Right. Uh, something I'll share with people, for example, is what's in my background is you mentioned that term uh, syndicate or syndication. Uh, I've done it a couple of ways prior to coming to the chamber. Uh, I had one group we wanted to get into real estate investment, but we knew that it'd be a challenge, one, from a knowledge standpoint, and two, financially. So our goal was to get 20 people, 5,000 uh, investment apiece, which would give us $100,000 back in the uh, early to, well, actually the mid to late 80s. Imagine what you could do with $100,000 in the real estate market uh, nearly 30 years ago or about 30 years ago. So that was the syndication, if you will, that we formed to do that. The other thing that I've been part of is groups that put together maybe $10,000, $15,000 a piece to invest in a small business so that it had the capital that it couldn't get in two or three. If you're in business as a small business, two, sometimes three years or less, you can't get traditional lender capital. But if you can get some people, like you said, to invest in you, that'll at least get you up and running. But the point you made is that when we did that, we were investing in the person because we believed in the person and the idea that they had. So l let me ask you one follow-up question. And that is, what does it take for people to believe in you enough as a person to invest, Jeff? Um, that's a really, really hard question. So the, that's one of the reasons why friends and family rounds are usually the earliest stage investors, because your friends and your family are the people who know you the best. They know your character. They know what you've done in your life personally and whether or not they should believe in you. Um, so usually when you're at those very, very earliest stages where the business isn't really formed yet, it's just barely beyond an idea. Your friends and family rounds are your best bets. Once you start going out to people who don't know you, um, then it gets more difficult. Unless you've actually had success before that you can point to, hey, I built this business where we raised capital and we ultimately had a success in this particular type of business. Um, many angels will invest on that behalf because they, they don't have to believe in you specifically. They know that you've done it. You've, raised, you've been successful with other people's money before. Um, so those are the, those are the most common ways to go about it. It is, it is hard um, to, without having proven your idea in the marketplace, just a little bit, the angels don't need much, but they need, they need a little um, that, that 
that you've that that somebody wants to buy this thing that you've to, that to, that you've built something people want, um, and that they're willing to engage with you about it. That's the that's the key to getting people who don't know you uh, to invest in you. And then for the people who do, um, that's always a tricky thing. You know, you want to maintain your relationships with your friends right, and family, right. and money can sometimes cloud that. Um, so everybody has to make their own decision about that. So, yeah. absolutely, uh, you know, to that point, And Lori, I, I saw you. I see your comments. So I'm going to expand on yeah. it a little bit. Uh, I can tell you uh, one of the other things that I did is I had a group of individuals, and I think we all remember the big tech boom. Uh, I had a group of individuals. We each. Uh oh. Uh oh. We lost Ken. Ken's yeah. frozen. At least he doesn't have a funny expression on his face. Oh, there he is. He's back. <laughs> oh, I'm not. Sure. I'm not sure what happened. Uh, let, let me. It, I, think it, I, think, yeah, I think it's a bandwidth thing, Ken. I think you're back. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Here, here's what I'll say. I had to start my story over again. Had a group of individuals. We each invested five hundred dollars during the tech boom. That $500, we were doing option contracts, not actual options. We're doing option contracts. That $500, it was five of us. We turned $2,500 into $28,000 over the course of about a 10-month period doing option contracts. Uh, the, the point I'm making is that one of the other things we learned is that different people have different tolerances because I turned around and tried to do that with another group and the market didn't cooperate. And to Jeff's point, what I figured out is that some of my friends, because of their risk tolerance or lack thereof, or just the way they thought about investments, they had no business, one, being in a group, and two, probably shouldn't have been doing investments because they weren't prepared to lose their money. That's one thing to keep in mind for investment is that you need to also factor in the fact that you may lose the money or you may only get a minimal amount of the money back. Uh, Jeff, you said that's the reason why they want so high a return. It's because it may take investing in 10, th 10 things for three of them to be viable and for one of those 10 to really be a huge hit. Uh, but again, you want to know your partners. Uh, Bob, let me ask this question. People are watching. They've, they're like, okay, great. We, we put some great information out there. How do I get started? So let me ask this question. If somebody comes into the school office right now, what do they need to bring so that the score appointment will be most productive so that they can move forward with possibly getting capital to an investor? What, what are you gonna be looking for and what would you suggest to them? Well, some of the things we've already, we've already touched on the business plan is going to be the most important piece because that is your roadmap as to how you're going to grow your business and that's what attracts investors the other piece of it is what are the resources that you have already brought to the table uh, what is the i'm going to call it the economic strength behind your business idea if you've got the idea you've got the ability to put together a plan and you've already assembled some economic resources, now we can help you do virtually anything else that you need. Um, as I say, there's 50 of us. Um, we had 2,000 people who walked through our doors last year and they all have a business desire uh, and it's our job to try and help them get where they want to go. Excellent, excellent. And I, and I hope people are taking it to heart that they can access the SCORE network. Uh, we also have the NSBDC network. Uh, we have a business success center here at the Urban Chamber, and you can access both of those resource partners as well as others uh, just by coming by the chamber. Uh, again, uh, to do that, uh, you can either call us 702-648-6222 or info at urbanchamber.org is a great entry email. Uh, our entire staff sees it, and then we'll get you connected accordingly. And what I'll ask each of the panelists to do again is just type in the website, the email, and the phone number for people to follow up. Uh, Thomas, uh, similar question. 
Uh, if someone wants to come by the SBA and talk to yourself, because uh, the great thing about you is you know a lot of people and a lot of people know you. So if someone wants to come by the SBA office to get started down this pathway to getting this type of capital, what do they need to do to make the appointment most efficient, most effective to move forward? Well, usually the first thing I do when we're in our office is to look around the corner to see if Bob's there or not. <laughs> <laughs> Bob and I have offices right beside each other. No, but for real, the biggest thing that I, I tell people, and, I, and I, this is from my experience for banking and everything else, people come in all the time and they'll go, well, I want to start a business, but I want to keep it separate from my personal. That's not going to happen. You have to go in full throttle you got to put everything in it and be willing I, I tell people when you go to a lender especially how you present yourself is the number one thing so be prepared as far as your business plan what you put into it what you were willing to put into it and understand that you have to be the one that put you know puts everything into it investors everybody you know, angel fish are a little more speculative than regular lenders, but they still want to make sure you have the commitment that you're going to put everything into it because that's the biggest thing, you know, many times I see, and I, I'm, I'm getting where I can't guess on, on who's going to be successful and who, who's not because, and, and a real quick, and I won't go into the whole story, but I had a guy come in, he sits down, he wants to start a restaurant, which is the number one thing we get, and, you know, it's not going to work. This guy owns two of the most successful restaurants in, in, in Las Vegas. But after talking to him, the guy had a plan. The guy had collateral. The guy had saved all his money. He'd been in this for 20 years. And he, his, he had the plan. And when it went to execution, it, it met the market, everything perfect. So, so I, I think the number one thing is just to be prepared that you have to put the commitment in. And if you want people to invest in you, then you got to be able to invest in yourself. Perfect answer. Per perfect answer. Uh, sometimes we hear people talk about they want to know that you have sweat equity, which is your personal time and focus. Uh, but they also may want to know that you have actual equity, meaning you put your finances in. If it's a little bit of savings or, or whatever, they want to know that you're all in to borrow a poker term. So. A great point, Thomas. And what I also like is that you touched on the fact that, again, something that may appear to be, quote unquote, crazy to others, may be innovative, uh, revolutionary uh, to a possible investor, uh, but it will come down to execution. So great, great story there, Thomas. Uh, Jeff, uh, from your perspective, uh, I know you've mentioned a few resources and given some uh, key highlights, but still, I want to ask this question because the bottom line is we want people to take action on what we're covering. Uh, my colleagues in the other panel, same thing. We want people to take action so that we can have a success story and some more small businesses. So if someone wants to get started with you, what do you tell them they need to do or bring with them so that they get started efficiently and effectively down the pathway to getting capital from an investor. Great, so there's two programs that we have right now. Uh, one for people who are a bit more advanced, they can apply to our uh, accelerator program at, angel, or at startupnb.org and just click the button. And you should have a basic pitch deck done. If you don't, when you apply, we're gonna ask you a bunch of questions about it. Um, and if you don't quite fit that model, we're, we're starting an online incubator, a virtual incubator program, um, which is just starting up this week actually, where you can go on into that platform and find a lot of resources to prepare yourself to be, to get into the accelerator. So that's that's one route. The next route is we actually are running our Angel NV Bootcamp right now. It started on September 8th, it finishes on December 8th. Our next uh, event is on, on October 20th. If you go to our website for that event, angelnv.com, um, you, can, you can register for the program. We've got all the prior sessions on YouTube so you can catch up and then start attending the, the, the lessons going forward. And, the person who I'll say wins, it's not actually a, a win. You, you, you can apply to the group of angels that we're putting together for a $200,000 investment. And if you are at an earlier stage or you feel like you're a beginner, that's really a great spot to start. It's free. Um, 
you get to learn all the things that angels want. Um, and you're doing it with, well, shoot, our last session had 125 people um, in the session. So over 200 companies that have signed up for it. So it's, it's a pretty cool program to sort of learn the basics. Um, and then you can decide after you're done, do I want to apply to the angels? Maybe I want to apply to Startup NV to the accelerator program, but you get to kind of learn in a safe environment first and then decide what to do. Uh, perfect. And if you would, Jeff, if you could once again uh, type your contact information as well as type the websites for those two uh, pathways, if you will. Uh, Thomas, I'd ask you to do the same thing if you would. Uh, type your contact information in again. And Bob, if you do the same thing as we prepare to uh, wrap up, because I want people that are watching to be able to follow up uh, on what on what's going on. I want to thank everyone, especially uh, Lori, you've been very active and you've helped to make sure that we cover things that uh, people are looking for. Uh, and, and you're right. Uh, getting investors is like dating. Uh, for example, uh, Bob Cushman mentioned the fact that you can have real estate investors and business investors, and there is a difference. Uh, you could have a multimillionaire that is a real estate investor, and you may go to him and he or she may say, I appreciate that you have a great business idea. I know you only want $5,000, but I only invest in real estate because I understand that as an investment. Uh, so it's important to understand uh, the types of investors, what their tolerance level is, what their experiences is. So, Lori, uh, great point. Uh, glad you could make it. Uh, I think I saw Nick Steele uh, pop in and out, and I know he's doing some things in the equity investment world. Uh, just saw uh, Christina uh, join us very quickly. What I encourage everyone that's here to do is cut and paste uh, what you see here, as well as uh, if you don't get the information that you're looking for in time to cut and paste, again, follow up with the Urban Chamber 702-648-6222 or via email info at urbanchamber.org and we'll be glad to help connect you with any of our panelists. Uh, now in our final few minutes here before we uh, break, uh, 30 seconds, uh, I want each of our panelists to give an encouraging word to those that are watching. 30 seconds, we'll start with Thomas, 30 second encouraging word. Well, one thing I think about this pandemic is, is we have found a lot of different ways created to help assist people, whether it's through Zoom, all our products that we have. So please reach out to us, however it is, and we, we'll try to make anything work that we can to assist anyone with you. Thank you very much, Thomas. Glad to have you. Uh, Bob Cushman, 30 seconds. Give everyone an encouraging word. Uh, and this is a headline from the Wall Street Journal, September the 26th. The IPO market parties like it's 1999. Let me suggest there's more money out there than you can shake a stick at. I've been in business since 1965. The amount of venture capital uh, and angel capital is huge. Wow, that's a great, thank you. Great way to segue to our uh, final panelists, uh, Jeff, 30 seconds, encouraging words. Follow your dreams, make believers out of your angel investors, and then return money for them. I mean, that'll, that'll lead to lots of happiness from a startup perspective. And like Bob said, there's tons of money out there. We're trying to organize it a little bit better for our Nevada companies, but keep at it. Um, whether it's us that can help you, if, if we can't, we're going to find somebody that can, but don't give up. These these tough economic times breed some of the very biggest and best companies in the world. So, so this is the time to get started. It really is. Perfect, perfect. And uh, what I'll conclude by saying, uh, two words I often use, join us. That's right. Join us at the Urban Chamber to be part of our equity investor network. As you see, we have some great resources here, individuals that can help you follow your dream and get the capital you need to make your dream a reality. I want to say thank you again to Jeff, Thomas, and Bob for being part of our uh, panel today. Also want to say thank you very much to all the participants out there. 
uh, for being part of this. Share the information. Again, share the information, and we look forward to you making the access to capital journey with us, plus sharing it with other people so that they can do the same. Uh, with that, uh, what I'll tell you is take a couple of quick minutes and then roll into our next session. If you go back to the uh, main stage, uh, someone will be there to talk to you about how to do the networking portion. But thanks again to everyone, and we look forward to you joining us to make the Access to Capital journey. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Great leadership, Ken. Thanks. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. Click the networking tab. Click the networking tab to go to the networking room.